Right now, our house feels like a Stephen King novel. If something could go wrong, it's going wrong. From black mold to mushroom spurs to all kinds of deconstruction, parts of our house has been condemned. We haven't been in our master bedroom since, I think, April. The house is filled with dust, and because of that, it feels as if plagues have been unleashed. Kim says, I've been killing gnats and mosquitoes and termites and flies and bees. I'm just afraid soon she's going to kill a human. <laughs> and then this week, if it just couldn't get any worse, there was a stench that just exploded throughout the house because our sewage pipes underneath our house broke. And it seemed like every time we tried to fix something, something else broke. But at first, it was one of those unexplainable phenomenons of, do you smell that? <laughs> smell what? Oh, that. And we think it's a rat or something trapped inside the house or something that has died. And have you ever experienced the symptoms of something, but you can't identify the problem? There is so much more going on in our house, underneath it, inside the walls, in basements and attics, that cannot be seen when you walk in, but can be experienced. That's very much the way we human beings operate. We can be so functional. We can be really exceptional at work. We can do everything that's expected of us by other people, but our inner worlds are in turmoil. There are things that are so profoundly broken that no one else can see, but you can begin to get a sense of them. There is, if the metaphor can be carried across, there's an, an odor. There, you can smell it when things aren't right. You can sense it. You can feel it even when you cannot see it. And, and one of the things that I had to grapple with as I began writing the seven frequencies of communication is that we're not experiencing the authentic version of those frequencies on an everyday basis. Most of the time, what we're experiencing in life are shadow frequencies. And I, I wish I could say just some of the time, but I think it's actually more often than not. Because our, our frequencies are not something we have, like a wallet, or a car, or a bill. Our, our frequencies are something we are. It's something we emit. They come out of the essence of our being. And so if we don't understand what's going on inside of us and don't grapple with that, we will not even be aware of the power of the frequencies we're emitting when we communicate. And one of the dangerous things about shadow frequencies is not simply how they affect the people you're speaking to, but they also have a dramatic destructive effect of how you speak to yourself. I want to read a, a few passages of scriptures to give us some context, and then we'll be a little more definitive. In John chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and we began here when we talked about the frequencies of light, and I want to go back here to look at these shadow frequencies as well. And with this word, speaking of Jesus, God created all things. Nothing was made without the word. Everything that was created received its life from him, and his life gave light to everything. The light keeps shining in the dark, and the darkness has never put it out. So I want to give you the framework of what's happening here. What the scriptures actually tell us is that we are all in a battle of darkness and light. But most of the time we project that outwardly. But what we're really seeing here is this extraordinary picture. The light was coming from within someone, not to someone, but out of someone, that Jesus was that light. And that light was the reflection of the life that only exists in him. But he says there's this battle, says the light keeps shining in the dark. And so there's this basic understanding that all of us are having to grapple with the darkness within ourselves. I don't think I need 30 seconds to convince you there's a darkness that tries to consume you. 
My, my wife's favorite show is Lost, and she's watched that so many times. I'm wondering if there's an addiction issue <laughs> or if she's just simply in love with Jack and Sawyer. But, but in that series, there's this ominous smoke, a darkness that pursues them, that threatens to consume them, that they do not understand. But all of us have this ominous smoke that pursues us, a darkness that threatens to consume us. And this battle is a battle between darkness and light. What I want you to understand this morning is that the battle between darkness and light is not a battle that is primarily fought outside of you, but is fought within you. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus tells us this. A good person has good things saved up in his heart. And so he brings good things out of his heart. But an evil person has evil things saved up in his heart. So he brings out bad things. A person speaks the things that are in their heart. This is a very simple, basic framework of life. What Jesus is telling us is that what's in your heart is what's going to emanate from your life. So you cannot expect something different coming out from you that is not inside of you. So if you want to change the way you you affect other people, change who you are. If you want to change the environment of your life, change who you are. If you want to change an external consequence or circumstance or condition of your life, change who you are. That every change you want to make in life begins with you, begins with me. And I I know we're more comfortable talking about all the good that's inside of us, but can we just have a a moment where we just go beyond political correctness and acknowledge that all of us have a war within us between darkness and light? However you define that, however you describe that, whatever language you're most comfortable with, there is a voice inside of you that calls you to the best version of you, and there's a voice inside of you that calls you to the worst version of you. And every day you have to decide what voice defines you and guides you. In Proverbs 26, verses 24 and 25, we are told this. Enemies disguise themselves with their lips, with their frequencies, with their words. But in their hearts, they harbor deceit and are hiding who they are. Though their speech is charming, Do not believe them, for seven shadows fill their hearts. When we were first developing the seven frequencies of communication, I I began having a conversation with what we call our arena community. It's a business community that interacts with us from around the world. And I said, just pick a show. Pick a show, and I'll break it down based on the frequencies. And I thought that'd be a lot of fun. It was just going to be a really, really interesting exercise, and and overwhelmingly, they picked two shows, Friends and Secession. I didn't even know people still watch Friends. I mean, most of you were not born when Friends stopped running. I'm just kind of curious, how many of you have actually seen an episode of Friends? Raise your hand. What is wrong with you? you, Let the show die. I mean, I don't remember ever watching Friends. I don't think I wanted any. And I remember, I remember traveling to Australia decades ago and discovering their number one show was Friends. They picked an American show to be their number one show. There's something about Friends that attracted people everywhere and still attracts them to this day. And they asked me to break down Friends, and I thought, oh, that would require me to watch it. And, and <laughs> so one of Friends fans, Brooke, Say, oh, it's so easy. Joey, motivator. Rachel, challenger. Monica, commander. Phoebe, healer. Ross, professor. Chandler, seer. I'll pretend I know who they all are. And I know enough to know that's exactly who they are. How interesting that Kaufman and Crane created a narrative where six people lived together and each one carried a distinct communication frequency. And all the comedy and all the tension was how they misunderstood each other because they could never get on the right frequency. 
But I chose secession, and I, I understand that I'm not supposed to like secession. I understand that I'm never supposed to watch it, and that I'm not even supposed to know it exists, but it is a fantastic series. <laughs> it, and, and so I, I went back to secession, having already watched it, and I went back to the pilot, and I panicked because when I was watching the pilot, I couldn't find a single one of the seven frequencies. And I thought, How, and maybe this is wrong. Maybe the, maybe the system, this, this paradigm doesn't work. And, and I stepped back. I had a little, you know, panic attack, you know, flooded with anxiety going, this is going to be so humiliating to go, this doesn't work, it's not accurate. And I had this little voice in my head that said, go back and look at the shadows. And I went back and looked at the shadows and instantly every character exploded off the screen. And it was so obvious that there were seven primary characters, and each one of them carried one of those frequencies, but only in their shadows. It's amazing how many episodes you can actually write from a shadow. And, and as, as I went back and started looking, I, I kept thinking, yeah, but they'll slip into their light. Almost never. Most of us have examples of human communication that emanate the darkest version of who we are. I'm just kind of curious. How many of you actually watch the session? Raise your hand. Not as many as friends. That's so interesting. <laughs> but what you find is that most of us use communication as a strategy, <laughs> as a strategy to conceal who we are, not to reveal who we are. Most of us use communication as a strategy not to connect at a deep level, but to create a utilitarian relationship of at best mutual benefit. How many of us have someone in our life where we simply tell them the truth of who we are? Not, not, not the truth of who they are. We love kind of doing that. I just, I need to tell you the truth. Right. Most of us think we're giving people a gift when we give them our opinion of how we feel about them. That's not authenticity because generationally, that's what authenticity became. You don't want me to speak my mind. You don't want me to speak my truth. You don't want, to tell, you don't want me to tell you how I really feel, but I'm just going to be authentic. I'm going to be real. I'm not going to be fake like you. I go, don't be fake. Just don't be a jerk. Right? There's a difference, right? You're confusing authenticity with obnoxiousness. See, authenticity is not you telling someone else what you think about them. Authenticity is you opening who you are to someone at the risk of rejection. And that is a much more difficult journey, isn't it? And what the scriptures tell us is that there's this battle within us, this darkness and light. And I wish I could tell you that there will be a day, because if you're here and you're on a genuine spiritual journey, you're going to hope that there's going to be a day where there is no darkness in you. There, there are no negative voices. There, there are no negative emotions. There are no negative motivations. But I'm telling you that as far as I can see, and all my understanding of everything I've read in the scriptures and all I know from human experience is that that war is yours every day of your life. That the great experience isn't that you do not have that battle. The great experience is that you win it. It's not that I'm not afraid. It's that fear doesn't hold me back. It's not that I don't struggle. It's self-doubt. It's that I don't let self-doubt define how I live it's, it's not that I don't struggle with loneliness or depression or a sense of insignificance. All that stuff is still there. You would have thought, by now, I'd have all that taken care of. That the only people that I know that do not struggle with a sense of insignificance or uncertainty or fear that they're not enough are really dangerous, narcissistic, sociopathic, and psychopathic people. When people say, I'm never afraid, I'm like, I'm afraid of you. <laughs> I never doubt myself. I'm like, wow. You should take a little longer look in the mirror. 
Because anyone who doesn't struggle with the basic human experiences isn't being honest about who they really are. I'm just going to do a little overview of the seven shadows. It may be the darkest 15 minutes in Mosaic's history. <laughs> but this is the Sunday leading up to Halloween. So I, I thought it was just perfect. Because we seem to like darkness. And we've been walking little Juno, who's three, around the blocks as our neighborhood decorates for Halloween. And we see all these skeletons and all these ghosts. I mean, if you think about it, there are no positive figures around Halloween. And, and we're walking, and she goes, are we afraid? <laughs> and I said, no, we think it's funny. <laughs> she goes, <laughs> we think it's funny. And so I'm, I'm kind of coaching her. They want you to be afraid. They want you to be afraid of everything that lurks in the shadows. They want you to be afraid of the dark. And we create them, skeletons and ghosts and witches and vampires and werewolves and demons and everything else that might lurk in the dark. Have you ever been afraid of the, the day? I mean, were you the one child that said to your parents, turn off the light? I don't want to see. I only feel safe in the dark. No. You are just like every other child who was never trained, but somehow instinctively knew the dangers and the darkness. Maybe that darkness was simply an external reflection of our internal fear. All right, so the seven frequencies. Maybe I'll have you raise your hand. How many of you have taken the assessment and know your frequency? I'm kind of curious. All right, so a little bit of you. We got a lot further to go. So I'm going to give you the positive one and then the negative. One of the dominant frequencies is the motivator. And I love motivators. And we talked about motivators because motivators bring energy in the room. And they're optimistic and they're positive and, and they help you build your self-belief. And, and if you're a motivator, people love you. You're so irritating. You're just incredibly likable. Like, you don't really have enemies. People do absolutely love to have you in the room because you bring this incredibly positive energy. And one of the things I love about motivators is they don't seem to see any weaknesses in other people. They just see the good stuff in you. They just see what's right with you. And I think Ted Lasso is like the perfect consummate motivator. Believe. Have you seen Ted Lasso? And yet, the motivator can have a negative frequency, can have a shadow frequency, and that shadow frequency is the performer. I just did a podcast in Dallas with a friend named Tim Ross, and, and he took the assessment right before we went on the podcast, and he said, my number one frequency is a motivator. I said, oh, that's great. And he goes, I read the shadows. He said it like that, you know, really ominous. I read the shadows. He goes, and they're 100% accurate. I have spent the last few decades in therapy trying to stop being the performer. And he was a stand-up comic, so actually, it would have worked for him. And, and he still is. And he said, I have fought all my life being a performer. And one of the great shadows of a motivator is that you know how to entertain a room, and so you become what everyone else wants you to be, what everyone else needs you to be. You become a projection of what you believe other people need you to be, and so you lose yourself. And you stop knowing who you are. And what happens when you use this frequency with others is that you convince them that you are who they need you to be. But there's always something missing, that, that, that connection of authenticity, that sense of, of transparency. Have you ever listened to someone that was so motivating, but something was off? You're like, I'm not sure if this is them or who they want me to see. But when you flip that shadow and you start talking to yourself, you know what you hear? You hear a voice that says to you, you can't let them see you. You need to be on you need to always be positive. You need to always bring the energy in the room. You can't be down. You can't be depressed. You can't be discouraged. And so you have this inner voice that's constantly telling you, you have to fake it until you make it. How has that become a popular phrase? And if you're working from the shadow of the motivator, you're faking it 
until you make it, until you fake it, until you think that's who you are. The second frequency is the challenger. And if you're a challenger, you're a person who's calling people out and calling people up. Not because you're mad at them, but because you see greatness in them. I have a friend right now named Ben Newman who's working for Kansas State University, their football team. And they're seven and one, and so we're always on WhatsApp. And I'm in, you know, just encouraging him after the games, before the games. And he's a challenger. And every time I watch his clips, he's, he's, he's on fire. I mean, he's like going, we can do this. You got it in you. You're tired. No, you're not tired. You're bleeding. It doesn't matter. That's just sweat with red. <laughs> and I, Ben is like that guy who has fire inside of him every second. And that team is elevated and elevated and elevated and elevated. And one of the beautiful things about challengers is when you have one in your life is that you will never settle for the lesser version of you. But when you're in the shadow, when you're a challenger, you become a manipulator. And the shadow of a challenger is that you don't use your power to help people become the best version of themselves. You use your power to move people to be who you want them to be, who you need them to be for your purpose and outcome. I had the craziest conversation right up here after the arena conference. This woman came up to me and she said, oh, by the way, every person who's challenged the assessment is a challenger. <laughs> Every person who's walked up to me and said, I don't think this is right. They go, is your number one challenger? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> There's the proof of concept. And they go, what? I said, only challengers challenge this thing right away. Okay. But this woman came up. She said, I didn't think it was right. I said, oh, you're a challenger. She goes, yes. Well, what? And I said, you're only challengers challenge. She goes, well, yeah, but uh, then you start talking about the manipulator. And I started thinking to myself, why can't manipulation be a positive thing? Why can't it be a strength? And then she said, then I thought to myself, oh, this is how a manipulator would think. <laughs> There's something dark inside of us when we're natural challengers that move us into the shadow of manipulators. It's all about whether your intention is their good or yours. And when you're around a challenger who's in their shadow, you never feel good enough. You never feel loved. You never feel validated. They, they cannot celebrate your success because if they celebrate your success, it means you're better than they're telling you. And one of the great dangers of being a, a challenger who's operating from the shadow is when you turn it on yourself. You have this voice that says to you, you still don't matter. You still don't have value. You may fool everyone else, but you don't fool me. I know how much you didn't do, how much you left on the table. You are a failure, and you will always be one. When the challenge your shadow turns inward, you are never enough. And you will work and work and work and strive and strive and strive for validation you will never find. And even your faith, there are a lot of challengers who go to church just to feel bad about themselves. I've weirdly had people tell me, you know one of the things I don't like about Mosaic, meaning me, <laughs> is that you don't talk enough about sin. Right, because that's what you need. You need to know how bad you are. If you don't walk out feeling like trash, it wasn't spiritual. That's the dark side of a challenger. And it's called a manipulator. And religion has used that shadow frequency for too many centuries. Then there's the commander frequency. When, you have a, when you're a commander, you're utilitarian. You just want to tell people what to do. You know what they should do. You know who should do it. You know when they should do it. Why are they arguing? There's one of those things. And, uh, and if you're a commander, life just looks so clear to you about what other people should do. But when you're operating in your shadow, you're a dictator. When you're operating in your shadow, you're not trying to move people to what's best for the whole or what's best for them. You're trying to get people to do what's best for you. Now, I, I, I live with a commander 
I do. And uh, I, I've been married to her for 40 years, and, and, I, and I'm, I am obedient <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> to her commands. But I have to tell you, I'm so grateful that Kim operates not in that shadow. But when you operate in that shadow, you're just trying to get people to do what you want to do for your own personal benefit. Because I've watched this. And have you ever, without being too political, I, I think this is the dilemma. This is why we're still using the language of Hitler. I mean, decades later, we're still talking about Hitler. And it's because instinctively we all know, and here's the dilemma, we all know we need a commander to lead us, but we don't want a dictator to control us. And so we're watching, going, is this the shadow or the light? Is this the shadow or the light? It feels like the light, feels like the shadow. And one of the great challenges is that when a person operates out of their shadow, even their strength of being a commander suddenly becomes this dangerous pathway where you wonder if you can trust them with your freedom or with your life. Then there's the healer. And when you're a healer, you create a frequency that brings safety and healing and wholeness to people. When you're around a healer, it's a beautiful thing. In fact, I watched this past week when someone said, how are you doing? And someone, and then they said, I'm not doing that great. And that person stopped. I thought, oh, that's really beautiful. Because you want to throw people off. You ever have people just go, how are you doing? Just go, I'm doing terrible. And they'll go, great, have a great week. They, 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 didn't, they didn't hear a word you said. That's how you'll be able to find the, the non-healers because they, they actually didn't heal, hear you because they don't want to hear you because they didn't really care, all right? And so when they go, how you doing? You go, oh, it's catastrophic, right? You know, it's, it's just pick a phrase, right? You know, and, and what's beautiful, though, when you say to a healer, when they ask you, how are you doing? You go, good. They stop. And even when you say good, they can hear the frequency of the pain. They can hear the frequency of the struggle. And they stop and go, what's going on? Isn't that the most terrifying question from a friend? <laughs> what's really happening? And sometimes what happens when you need healing in your life and you have a healer in your life, but you're falling apart, but you don't want someone to talk to you about what you really need to talk about, you, get, you, you, you ghost them. Sometimes we ghost healers because we're not ready to be healed because we're not ready to acknowledge the wound and do what it needs to be healed. But when you're in your shadow, you become a cipher. And one of the most dangerous things in the world is when you have a healer frequency and you become a cipher and you start taking that shadow and absorbing everyone's love, everyone's affection, everyone's wounds, and you use them for your own healing and therapy. This is what I really struggle with, the way people talk about God. Frankly, if you listen to a lot of views about God, God sounds like a cipher. You need to worship God. God needs to be worshipped. Like, he's been, he's been worshipped by thousands of, and millions and maybe billions of people. How much worship does he need? Right, think about that. You need to worship all the time. Well, is he like relentless in his need? The language, oh, God needs to be glorified. All the language of God is like he's this narcissist who created this amazing universe. All so that we can go, great job, God. You're, you're like awesome. And I'm going to worship you so that you don't set me on fire and kill me. And, <laughs> and we treat God as if he's a cipher. God didn't create you because he needed worship. And he doesn't invite you to worship because he needs to be adored. He knows what you need. And when you open up your life to him, you begin to open up your life to love. God is not a cipher. He's not draining humanity of our love. God is pouring his love into humanity. The truth is, when it comes to God, we are all the ciphers. The relationship is 100 to zero. God doesn't need anything from you or from me. And he has everything we need for life. But we, oh, we can call up. That's good. But, but we humans are different. We consume each other. You ever have 
a friend, maybe they're still your friend, where you get on the phone and you realize when the phone call's over, they did all the talking. <laughs> or it was you. Like if you say, no, I don't have a friend like that. You are the friend like that, okay? And you ever had a friend that no matter how much pain you're in, all they talk about is their pain? And you can't figure out how to turn it? And it's like, if you say, oh, I have a cold, oh, yeah, I have the flu. You go, oh, I, I have the flu, I have COVID, right? Oh, you know, I, I sprained my arm. Yeah, yeah, I broke my wrist. You go, I lost my leg on a machine the other day. Go, oh, yeah, yeah, I lost both. It's like, they're, they're, no matter what you say, they, they just up you with their pain. By the way, if you're always upping people with your pain, you got a little cipher happening. You can't take a moment where it's focused on someone else's healing. So many of us, and let me tell you, this is what drives me crazy sometimes about religion, church. People come and go, where do I get this? Rarely do people come and go, where do I give this? There's something about us that we're drawn together, even the spiritual spaces where we go, oh, you know, it's not really speaking to me anymore. Or I need to go someplace, you know, where, where it's deeper. Or I, whatever we say, it's always about us. It's never about, I, I just couldn't, I just needed a place I could serve more. They didn't need enough money. I have had one friend, I, I, I want to go ahead and say that, who came to Mosaic, and I said, how come you came back? He goes, you know, I went to my wife's church, and they didn't need my money. They're a Korean church. And he goes, they didn't, I asked him, where can I get? They go, we don't need your money. He goes, I wanted to come back here where you really did need my money. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that, that, but that's so rare. Most of the time we go where we can get, not where we can give. Yeah. Yeah. When you're a cipher, you're just sucking the life out of other people's love. And you're trying to find healing for yourself. And that inner voice, you know what the inner voice tells you? You will never be healed. That inner voice also tells you you're the victim. No one understands you. No one sees you. No one cares about you. Your inner voice, when you're a cipher, will convince you that what everyone else did for you, you deserved, and they did not do enough. If you walk away from people because they didn't show up for you, the cipher is working within your soul. I had the most interesting thing the other day. Someone actually said to me something about, um, hey, how come you haven't called me and invited me you know, to one of the sporting events you go to? And before I could say anything, a guy next to me goes, well, let me ask you, since he invited you the last time, how many things have you invited him to? Zero, by the way. And, uh, and I think that many times in life, we see life from what comes to us rather than what comes from us. And then you have, I'm going to move a little quicker, the professor. And the professor is a person who builds into people by teaching, passing on information, data, truth. It's a beautiful thing. But when you're the cipher professor, you're a demeanor. You, you are dismissive of people, and you have to put them down. And when you're in your shadow as a professor, you have to prove that you're the smartest person in the room. You have to prove that other people aren't as talented or as gifted or as intelligent or as knowledgeable. And when you're in your shadow as a professor, you're not trying to lift people up above yourself. So here's the question. If you have a professor frequency, how many people have you raised up who have been more successful than you? Or are you always trying to keep the world your student because you need to be the teacher? And the most powerful thing that happens when you're out of that shadow as a professor is that you are teaching people and they get better than you. And that to me is the great goal, isn't it? That someone that you've invested your life in does something better than you've done it. And you celebrate that because when you're the teacher, when you're the mentor, the measure of your success is their success, not your success. But when you're in the shadow of a professor, you're a demeanor, and you have to keep people small. Beware of people who need to feel like they're more by making you less. Do not become smaller to fit into someone else's life. And then you have the seer, which is the visionary who sees the big picture, who brings hope to people. 
And our culture is so absent of Sears. By the way, the reason the entire political process right now is so acerbic and negative and violent and vitriol is because there's no vision. When you have vision, you do not have to attack your opponent. You just cast a picture of a better future. Both sides of this equation lack a vision for the world. The only vision they have is the other person is more dangerous than me. But when you're a seer and you move into your shadow, you become a perfectionist. And when you're a perfectionist, you get paralyzed because your vision is so big and so beautiful and so grand. I wonder, how many of you have a script in your heart? I'm just going real specific that you've never written. You know why you won't write that script? It's because the first word isn't good enough. Right? Because you can't find that perfect first sentence or the second sentence. You cannot create a great script if you don't have the courage to write a bad one. I mean, who spends $200 million on a movie and creates a bust? Like when you spend $200 million on a movie and you get 18% on Rotten Tomatoes, you just, wouldn't you just want to jump off of a bridge? Except you know what they did? They finished a movie. Have you ever wondered how it is that the person whose movie is so bad gets another movie? And they get another movie? And they get another movie and think, how can that terrible director keep directing? How can that terrible football coach keep coaching? How can that terrible actor keep acting? You know why? Because getting it done is better than dreaming it up. And when you're in the shadow of a frequency that is the seer, you're just a perfectionist. And you criticize, oh, this is so Hollywood, I'm sorry. I mean, you can't go to dinner without someone talking bad about another director or another actor or another movie or another work of art. You know why? Because we are so awesome at doing nothing <laughs> but criticizing the people who are doing something. And when you are in the shadow of the seer, you're just a perfectionist. You can show the flaws in everything. You can show why someone else isn't really that good. And you can talk about your dreams and your ideas and your vision, but you'll never do anything when you're in the shadow because that voice in your soul tells you the moment you try to do something, everyone will know you're a fraud. That little voice will tell you, you can't do it the way you see it, so don't try. Let it live in your imagination. Every dream you have, every idea you have that lives in your imagination and dies in your imagination was worthless to the world. And when you have that shadow that tells you you can't act until it's perfect, that's the shadow that will paralyze you. And then finally, there's the maven. And the shadow of a maven, this is the person who sees the world differently. This is a person who just thinks outside of the box, who doesn't think in a normative, conventional way, but their shadow is the nihilist. And I've just been struck by two terrifying examples of a nihilist. Because if you've ever know, known the character Thanos, which means death, Thanos' solution to the evil in the universe was to destroy half of it. There's this darkness that overwhelms you when you move into the shadow as a maven that causes you to believe that the world can't get better, that people can't get better. And I'm haunted by the one line from Secession where a character named Tom asks Greg to join him in a plot to overthrow the family's empire. And Greg says, he says, I'm asking you to sell your soul Tom says, and then Greg says, what am I going to do with a soul anyway? And the mavens are the nihilists who, when they give up on creating a better world, move into this destructive view that nothing is real, nothing matters. And they'll spend their life destroying the good other people are doing rather than doing some good. You can't change the whole world, Right? You can't end all the wars. You cannot end all poverty. You cannot end all suffering. So the easiest thing to do is to say, what's the point? And when you're in the shadow, you hear a voice that says, why try? You can't fix it. Why try? It's not going to get better. Why try? It's all going to hell. 
Sometimes I sit back and I remind myself that what I believe inside of my own soul is insane. I actually believe humanity can become humane. I believe that we can create a world filled with peace. I believe we can end injustice. I believe we can end poverty. And I believe that we're designed to be a beautiful reflection of God. And I know all these thoughts are absurd. But I would rather die believing in the best of us than live always believing in the worst of us. All of us have these shadows that speak to us. They tell us who we're not, why we will never live the life we're created to live. They will tell us why we can't be loved, why we don't have value. And those voices will haunt you all your life until you learn that they're the shadows and the only way you can get rid of a shadow is turn on the light. Which is exactly why Jesus came. There's a process. He says, I'm the word. I am the frequency that speaks life into you. I am the word that brings life. When Jesus comes into our lives, he brings life into us. And when that life erupts in us, a light emanates from us. And what we know about the light is that it's at war with the darkness. And the darkness has a lot of weapons, but all the weapons of darkness only work in the dark. The one weapon darkness doesn't have is a weapon that stops the light. So all darkness can do is speak to you and grow the darkness inside of you. The only strategy darkness has is to convince you that you are the darkness. But the moment you reject that voice, the moment you reject the dark side of us, the moment you decide, I'm going to be fully alive and I'm going to allow the light of Jesus to transform every aspect of my being. And everywhere I go, I will bring light to dark places. You become the warrior of light. And nothing in the darkness will prevail. Nothing in the darkness can survive the power of the light in you. What if, what if we just start here? May your words speak life to those in your life. You can't fix the problem in Ukraine. You cannot solve the problem in the Middle East, unless you're someone I don't know. But here's what you can do. You can stop speaking death into the people in your life. You can stop listening to the darkness that eats up your soul and makes you less. You can choose right now to take responsibility for the power of your words and let a frequency of life and light come from you to the world. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? Jesus came to expel the darkness in us so that the light would prevail. If you're here and you've never crossed the line of faith and entrusted your life to Jesus, I want you in this moment to make a choice to step out of the darkness into the light, to let Jesus bring his life into you. The way that happens is you have to invite him. You have to invite Jesus to come into the space of your soul and to bring his life and his light in you. Which is why I invite you to pray a very simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Just a simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. If you're tired of fighting the darkness inside of you alone, if you're tired of those shadow frequencies telling you what you're not, who you'll never be, what you'll never know, that you'll never have, who you'll never become, then silence those shadows now and let Jesus be the voice that guides you. Right now, just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. If this is your prayer, 
whether you're here or in South Pass, I want you to raise your hand right now. If you just whispered that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life, just hold up your hand really high right now. Beautiful. Anyone alone? Anyone else? Beautiful. Jesus, I give you my life. Wonderful. Jesus, I give you my life. Beautiful. Father, I thank you for each person who in this moment has taken this huge, courageous step and opened up their life to you. I pray, God, that they would know that you, you have heard their prayer. You've heard them whisper these words, Jesus, I give you my life. And that your response has been to bring your life into them. And that your life and your light would prevail in them. That today would be the beginning of new things, of a new life, of a new future. We thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's just thank God for everyone who responded to him. So when you face your own ghosts, your own phantoms, your own skeletons, your own vampires, and you're walking and you feel fear in your life, just listen to that little voice and say, oh, no, no, we're not afraid. It's just funny. When darkness thinks it can prevail over light, it's out of its mind. They do not know the power that dwells in me. Hey, love you guys. Thank you.